Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone in the house of the Lord this morning, and we want to welcome those joining us online. This morning, I'm thinking of a passage of scripture from John chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. If you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And this is the passage that discusses that. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship is directly linked to our identity as children of God. It's a lifestyle. And a lot of times we get focused on this, the stage presence, the, the singing together on Sunday morning. But worship is a heart posture. It's a lifestyle. It's worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's our hearts taking the time, making that conscious effort that everything that we do with our lives, we want to do to honor and please God. All of us make mistakes. All of us have fallen short. We're not perfect. But the heart posture is the one that says, Lord, I repent. I know I'm not worthy, but I love you and I want to seek you and I want to worship you with my life, with my whole heart. So this morning as we join together, we do want to sing, we want to play instruments, we want this to be a celebration, but in that celebration we want it to be abundantly aware that our hearts are worshiping God that we're seeking God, and as we sing these words, that God is able, that he never fails, that he's close to us, that he works all things together for our good, that those are things that we can plan ourselves on, that we can build ourselves on that solid rock foundation and worship him from that heart this morning. So if you're willing and able, let's stand together and have a word of prayer. God, Lord, we come to you. Almighty Heavenly Father, worthy of all of our praise. We come here this morning with a desire to empty ourselves of worldly things to empty ourselves of the anxieties of life. To lay down our brokenness and understand that you, God, have got a plan and a purpose for us. That you saw us before the foundation of the world. You knew us before our birth here on this earth. And you loved us all along and you still love us now. We don't want to make any of this about us. We don't want to make it what we want it to be. But we want to be focused on your will, your plan. We thank you that you brought us together this morning and that we have this amazing opportunity as a congregation, as a church family, as a body of believers in Christ, to sing songs, to celebrate you, Lord. But as we do that, help us to maintain our focus of a life that pleases you, a life that gives you honor, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth with who we are. Lord, we ask forgiveness for the times that we've failed to do that, and we know we've all failed to do that. But God, mold us and shape us into the men and the women that you would have us to be. And help us to live lives of worship. 
and let it start if it hasn't already begun. Now, as we join together in song, we thank you and we praise you for your presence here, for loving us, for directing us. And God, we give everything in us to you. We thank you for just being here this morning and for all that you are and all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Wow, it is good to be back at Kerwinsville Alliance. I love being here with you and so enjoy your presence and the ministry we have here. Laurel and I were away last week. We were in Albuquerque, New Mexico because I have a granddaughter there. Uh, and so we went to see her. We bumped into my son and his wife while we were there as well. <laughs> and uh, some have said, how is your granddaughter? And here's the answer to that. Perfect in every way. That's all there is. It's just a good time. And so thanks for those of you that filled in while I was gone, uh, different things, uh, doing this thing I'm doing right now and other things. And didn't Pastor Brad bring a great message last week? Uh, I listened to it online and it was fantastic. And I know a lot of you are thinking, wow, it's good to hear a good sermon every now and again. And I can understand your thinking along those lines. I want to share with you a few announcements this morning. I want to talk to you about Secret Sister, and I'm just going to read this uh, Secret Sister memo, so to speak. In our church, we've had for probably 20 years, I don't know, a ministry called Secret Sisters. And some, you, some of you might think that's the best kept secret at Kerbinsville Alliance. Uh, here's what it is. It's a program, uh, kind of an outreach ministry toward women in the church. And if you participate, you will draw a name of a woman who becomes your secret sister for a year. And you become her silent prayer partner, her secret uplifter or lifter upper, whichever you want to think of yourself as. And so like if I happen to be secret sisters with Eric Rolls, <laughs> I just kind of look and say, wow, this is um, Eric's birthday. Maybe I'll buy him a special gift this month. Or this is, this is the, the time when Eric got that speeding ticket. I'll be praying for him. <laughs> Uh, extra hard this month. So you're praying for that person. You're lifting them up. They don't know who you are. And likewise, someone has your name and they're doing the same thing for you. It's really all about encouraging, praying for, and supporting each other in small ways while keeping it a secret. Um, there's and, and to become a secret sister, you fill out the questionnaire, questionnaire that is in the lobby on the table and return it by the end of this month. And on February 5th, we draw the uh, names and you'd find out who becomes your secret sister. Once your names are drawn, you can send them cards anonymously and special gifts throughout the year. So like you might want to, if, it, if you have my wife as a secret sister, she loves chocolate chip cookies. Wait, that's me that loves chocolate chip cookies. Okay, never mind that. So you, you would send special gifts uh, throughout the year, um, at least once a month or special holidays, occasions that happen in her life. You can place the gifts in the lobby with that person's name on it. Keep in mind, uh, it's a thought that counts. Uh, something homemade, a sweet treat, uh, a simple gift. It's just your way of saying, you are in my thoughts and I'm praying for you regularly. If you have questions, speak to Julie and uh, read this if you want it more explicitly detailed because I kind of... Uh, I tend to paraphrase when I read those things. So read it for more specific details. I encourage you ladies to participate in that, okay? Um, we have a ministry in our church to the teens. It's called Nightlife. And one of the things we do, we, we teach them the Bible. We talk to them about their lives. We have worship that happens there. Um, they do activities, fun things together, and we feed them as well. And this, that's where you come in on the, we feed them as well. If you would like to be involved in that by maybe preparing a meal for those who attend life, Nightlife, um, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board near the elevator uh, for each week. So you pick the week of your choice and uh, you, can, you can do that that <laughs> way. Um, I'm looking for Milton. Are you present, Milton? No, he's not here. Pardon me? Oh yeah, he's at Mahaffey. Brand is at Mahaffey. The youth guys, the youth, a lot of them, and the youth guys are at Mahaffey right now. But if you have any questions, you can speak to them about the meal thing. I really encourage you to sign up for that. We pray and pray and pray and pray for children and teens in our church family. And then we remember that comes with a, a, a wonderful opportunity to show them the love of Christ and to help them like coming here so that they can grow in their faith. So jump on board with that if you would. Speaking of nightlife, now here's an announcement that you need to pay attention to. Don't pay any attention to the rest of them, but you gotta pay attention to this. No, just kidding. Nightlife is not going to happen tonight, nor is children's ministry, nor is the adult small group. And that's because the kids are still at, at um, uh, thank you, that thing, um, replenish at Mahaffey Camp. So just be aware of that. There are no activities at Kerbinsville Alliance tonight. Um, Board of Ministries is meeting this week, so be aware of that. Wednesday evening Bible study, this is your last chance to sign up for that. Be aware of that. Annual meeting is next Sunday at 9 a.m. That's on the 22nd. Uh, reports are due today, so please turn them in or email them and or email them to the Alliance Church Secretary. Um, and the rest of these announcements, I'm going to let you read on your own. All right. Let me share with you just some things we're praying about. 
Well, before I do that, I'm going to ask Dave Clark. Dave, <coughs> can you come and talk to us about the Sportsman's Banquet that we have? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Dave is always out there waving at me, and, and I'm, yeah, no, he wasn't, I'm kidding. Okay, so I uh, have tickets with me today for the game dinner, and for those that might not know what the game dinner is, if you're new here, uh, we have for many years, I don't even know the number anymore, we have an annual sportsman's banquet that we put on. Uh, we give out 300 tickets, and we serve a meal uh, to everybody that's here, and we always hire a speaker to come in that mixes the outdoors and Jesus together in the same message, typically. And uh, this year's speaker is going to be Steve Sorensen from The Everyday Hunter. He's from up near the New York line. Um, he's been here before. He's a very good speaker, and uh, we appreciate him every time he comes. So you say to yourself, 300 people, we're going to serve 300 people a meal. That takes a lot of hands to put that on. So on the bulletin board, I have sign-up sheets. You can participate in a number of different ways. Uh, the first way is you could bake a couple pies. Put your name on the list and bring some pies. And I say bake, and it could be your friend Marie Callender maybe has them. Uh, we, Judy Kim used, was here, and we always think of Judy when we think of the sportsman's banquet. And she used to always say her and her friend Marie got together, and they made those pies, and she'd bring them with them. So any, any way we can get to fill up the pie sheet is always good. Um, and, there, and the list is on the board. The other way, another way you can help is with setup. On Friday evening, we'll get together around five o'clock and we'll set all the tables and chairs and put the silverware out and everything like that. Many hands make light work. We've done it in as little as an hour and a half and we've done it in three and a half hours. So depending on how, many, how much help we get, it uh, can go quick. And then also we need cooks for Saturday morning. Uh, we get here about 6 a.m. on Saturday morning, and we cook usually till about lunchtime, and then uh, put everything in roasters, and then it continues to cook for the rest of the day until the time of the meal. And then also there is, uh, we need servers to help with serving of the meal, and uh, like I said, there's an individual sign-up sheet for each one of these. So if you've never participated in an event, if you're new here, this is a great way to plug in. We have a lot of fun. There's a lot of laughs. There's no pressure for anybody but me, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's another way you can help. And then also the dreaded cleanup always happens. And if you're going to volunteer for cleanup, it typically happens right after we're done eating, which means you'll miss the program. So that's something to consider. But uh, you can plug in any one of those ways. If you've never done anything like that, we welcome you to come aboard. We'll get you, we'll plug you in somewhere and get, keep you busy for sure. So. Um, I have tickets, like I said, here today, so if you need tickets, get a number in your head and get to me before you leave today. I'll have them until they run out. They're first come, first serve. And if you miss and you call me and you tell me that you wanted tickets but you forgot to call me and I tell you I'm out, what I tell everybody is I've never, and I've been doing this six or seven years or thereabouts. 30, 40, yeah. 50. And I've never <laughs> not been able to get somebody a ticket because typically somebody will take six or eight tickets, and then two or three people can't come, so they bring the, give me the tickets back. And that's what I always tell everybody. If I gave you tickets and you find out that they couldn't come, make sure you get the tickets back to me because I always have a waiting list of people that need them. But we've always been able to fill that. So, so that's my uh, plug for the Sportsman's Banquet, and I hope you're willing to participate. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate the Sportsman's Banquet because it brings people to our church who maybe otherwise wouldn't even know we existed. And that's a beautiful thing. I was talking to Bill, he and Angie are back there, and uh, I, I mentioned the Sportsman's Banquet, and I kind of described it to him, and, and Bill said, I've been here, Eric brought me here. And now Bill's sitting in our church family, and I know there's others as well, that that has been the bridge that helped us connect with you. And we're so thankful for that. Um, I know that there are individuals who, through the Sportsman's Banquet, have not just connected with us and started attending Kermansville Alliance, but have found Christ as their Savior as a result of that. Maybe not that night, but in, in what followed that. And uh, to God be the glory. It's a great thing. So jump on board with that if you can. I do want to share with you some things we're praying about at Kermansville Alliance. And uh, let me just uh, run down a, a short list of that. 
One of them is, you know, we were praying for Heath Hawkins. Heath um, had the brain tumor, and that was taken care of, and he got a clean bill of health from that. He's so excited because he's a teenager. He wants to engage in sports and have a lot of fun with that, and it looks like he blew his knee. We're not really sure how, but uh, you can imagine how frustrating. Hi, Heath. I, didn't, I was looking and looking for you. There you are. And uh, we're not sure exactly what happened to Do you know exactly what it is now? Tell me. A bucket tear. Okay. He, okay. Okay, great. Um, my heart goes out to you, buddy, because I know you've just been waiting and waiting to do sports and everything else, and you were so good to follow the doctor's orders previously. It hardly seems fair. And uh, so my heart really goes out to you, and we will be praying that it can be a quick healing, and uh, you'll be better soon, okay? Yeah, so pray for Heath, if you would, on, along those lines. Uh, pray also for all the kids in our church family that might be dealing with some sicknesses. I think of Little Cove uh, as one of them. And I appreciate your prayers as well for some of my grandchildren who off and on are dealing with that sort of thing. Sickness, that is. So remember them in prayer. Uh, do be praying, if you will, for Shirley Nieper and her family. I think almost everybody knows Oscar Nieper. And Shirley attended church here for years. Oscar passed away. His funeral is coming up uh, in the first week of February and it will be here at the church. Just do pray for Shirley and for the rest of the family uh, in their time of loss. Remember to pray for Clyde and Marsha. Remember to pray for Melissa Miller. Her husband was at the early service and said, the doctor's really pleased with how she's progressing. She's going to Pittsburgh for some follow-up, but you know, she fell and had an injury and she's doing, doing really well. So we're praising God for that. Michelle Clark is on our list and we're praising God that she's here this morning. She's been sick since 1972 and uh, <laughs> We've missed her all that time. It's so good to see you here, Michelle. Um, remember her, Jan McGarry, Erla Schiffer. Uh, remember some of them. Um, remember, if you would, as well, I mentioned Oscar, but also, you know, Peggy Roan had a daughter who passed away, an adult daughter about my age who passed away. And be praying for that family, if you would, in their time of loss. I would always encourage you to pray for our international workers. Remember Crystal and her husband. Remember the Marins. Uh, remember... Um, the Fords and uh, the Kinderbotters, the Bills, not the Buffalo Bills. Uh, I would pray for the Buffalo Bills, but I'm not thinking of them right now. Uh, but remember the Bills and remember B-E-Z M-N-L uh, as well. So uh, those are just some things we'll be praying about later this morning. Okay? I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll come at this time. We'll worship the Lord with our gifts. You know, this is a time when those of us who call Kermansville Alliance our church home give our tithes and offerings. And if you're visiting with us today, we certainly don't expect you to give. We're just glad you're here and trust God will speak to you and, and be with you during the worship and you will find this as a, a good expenditure of your time. Seth, would you please pray for the offering this morning? Amen. Once you've added your offering, you can stand with us and we'll continue to worship the Lord. Constant in the trial 
You may be seated. Morning. Morning. So, uh, Steve had mentioned earlier about uh, Bill being introduced to the church through the sportsman's dinner. Uh, ironically, that's the first time I came to this church was through a sportsman's dinner. Huh. So, that ministry is effective. Um, don't dismiss the effectiveness of any ministry. Um, if God is behind it, uh, people will be blessed and he'll be honored. Um, just to extend that story. Let's, let's pray together this morning. Lord, we're thankful for being in your house and being in your presence as we talk with you this morning. Lord, we pray for those that come to our mind that are in need. Those that are private requests. Those that are private pains in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would be with them. That we would feel your presence. That we would receive it. Lord, I think of those that have suffered losses recently. Lord, I pray that you would be with those entire family members. That you would be honored. That you would be sought after. Lord, I pray for our youth this weekend. I pray that as they are presented the gospel, that they are presented those things that Mahaffey speakers have for them, that they would be able to receive that, that their hearts would be open to seek you. Lord, I'm thankful for leaders that are able to and willing to do these things. Lord, I think this morning of the additional prayer requests. I think of Lois, that you would be with her through this illness that she has. Lord, I pray for Heath this morning, that the doctors would be able to repair and that the recovery would be short and quick and perfect. Lord, I pray that you would be with him specifically, that you would give him a level of grace and patience. Lord, I think about, as Drew mentioned earlier, shape us and mold us into the people you would have us be, that you would use us as clay that we would be an impact on others around us as you would have us be. We are honored to serve you, to obey you. Lord, I ask that you would be with us this morning as Steve presents what he has on your, has on his heart that you have presented to him to give to us. That our hearts would be open to receive, that our minds would be able to understand it accept it, and apply it. We give you the honor. We give you the grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. At this time, the children are dismissed. If they'd like to go to Children's Church, they're welcome to do so. See you guys later. All right. So did you see or did you hear Eric get his tang all tangled up? Did you hear that? When he prayed, he said um, about God, um, what you, what, what Steve has put on your heart, God. And then he caught himself, he switched it, what you have put on Steve's heart. And, and I thought to myself when he said that, you know what? I have put things on God's heart. So have you. Every time you pray, you take something that is a burden that's on your heart and you place it on his heart. And his heart carries that. That's nothing to do with the sermon. It was just a really good observation that uh, hit me in the head, and I thought, ah, I kind of like that. Hey, I do want to apologize. I didn't mention Lois uh, Miller. She does have COVID. Uh, this is kind of neat. Um, Lois texted me and said, I took a COVID test. 
a home test, tested positive, and I said, well, I'm really not that sick. That can't be right. So she took another one and tested positive, said, I'm really not feeling that bad. It can't be right. So she went to the hospital and have a test and tested positive. She said, I must have COVID, but I don't feel that bad, but I do feel a little bit bad. So I feel like that's beautiful, isn't it? That's the kind of... I, I just want the COVID that lets me sleep and sleep and sleep, and then I'm good. That, that would be okay. And, uh, but do pray for her. I don't know how she's feeling today. I haven't spoken to her uh, in the past day or so, so remember her in prayer. I also want to give you an update. I went to see my doctor again, and uh, for those of you that don't know, I had cancer. I had surgery. I uh, went to see the doctor. He said, hey, that looks good. I think we got everything we needed to get, and uh, there's a couple more tests. Got the next test. Said, that's good. You're looking good on that test. I got the last test results this past week. Talked to my doctor about them. He said, zero. He said, you are cancer-free, and I just praise God for that. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your concern, and all glory to God. I, I am just so thankful. Yeah, you know, it's kind of weird. You walk into, I mentioned this, I think, a week or two ago in service. You walk into Dollar General, and someone says, how you doing, Steve? And you can tell they want to know, right? And, and, and so I say, well, I'm doing well, my doctor says. And I look, and there's like three people. They're, they've turned. Because this community is Kermansville, and people know one another, and they care about one another. And I just love that. I love it. And, I, and then I'll look at all of them, and I'll say, thanks for praying for me, you guys. Uh, because uh, that's just a beautiful thing. I would like to ask you, well, yeah, I'd like to ask you if you would open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in two different passages, Ecclesiastes 1 and then Psalm 127. But there's a Bible app event for this message. You probably saw the QR code when you walked in. And I'm not going to put a lot of this stuff on the screen because there's so many passages of Scripture, but they're all in that Bible app event. And they're also in the Bible in your hand. A paper Bible would have that. And if you didn't bring a Bible, there's a Bible in a rack. And it would be really helpful to you if you could see that. This is the last in a series of sermons on, on roadways that lead you to unwanted behavior. And that's just a weird kind of a phrase, roadways that lead you to unwanted behavior. And, and I wanna kind of tell you where I got this idea. I'm reading a book with a friend and it's called Unwanted and it has to do with unwanted behavior. It's by Jay Stringer. And this is a book that is made for people who have found themselves engaged in a, in a in a practice that, in, I'm, see, I'm being kind of vague. You're going to have to listen, adults. Ready? They found themselves engaged in a practice on the internet that hasn't taken them where they wanted to go, and they can't stop looking. Everyone know what I'm talking about? Okay? Right? The unwanted behavior that Ray Stringer is writing about is that kind of behavior. So a buddy of mine and I were reading this together and because, and, and it's a great book. If you wanna know the book, it's the best I've ever read in this. I've been handling men's group for 30 years and it's the best I've ever seen. And you know, and, and it, it, I know it might be awkward to go to your pastor and say, I think I need that book. I think, you know what I mean? So, so just say, I need that book for a friend and, and I'll, we'll let it go with that, okay? Um, just a great book. Um, in chapter eight of that book, as we were reading it and discussing it, I saw like he has six areas that this affects people in. They're, they're areas that when you involve yourself in them, they take you to that place that you don't wanna go. And I thought about that. I thought those are like roadways that take you to that place you don't wanna go. But the place you don't wanna go isn't always what the author's talking about. Sometimes the place you don't wanna go is bitterness. Hmm. Sometimes the place you don't wanna go is alcohol abuse. Sometimes the place you don't wanna go is drug abuse. Sometimes the place you don't want to go is promiscuity. These highways, these areas, he calls them, I call them highways, take you to places of unwanted behavior that you can't figure out how to get out of. How do I get off of this highway? And that's what this series has really been about as we've been discussing it. And uh, you can see that, uh, does that look familiar to you? How many of you look at that PowerPoint and you say, that looks familiar to me? Put your hand up. Good, there's three or four of you that pay attention. I used that two years ago, that very same blue car on a very same roundabout for a different sermon. But uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, I'm glad to know I can recycle things. I'm gonna do this series again in two weeks. <laughs> All right, let's get started. When I was a kid, I went through a stage of listening to a musician named C.W. McCall. Who knows who C.W. McCall is? Put your hand up. Ah, oh, yeah, good, good. The hillbillies know, right? And uh, he had a song called 
Convoy Breaker 19. This year's rubber duck. How many know now? Yeah. See, that just tripled the number right, right there. Yeah. And I, I love that. It was great for redneck kids like me. And I was, you know, a Jeep guy and he was a Jeep guy. And that kind of music was fantastic. Chip Davis, who was behind a lot of that and went on to do Mannheim Steamroller. Some of you probably know him, which is a completely different kind of music, but it's, uh, it's pretty neat. One of the, the lesser known songs uh, done by that group by C.W. McCall was a song called Black Bear Road. My brother got the vinyl albums and we listened to them together. Black Bear Road was a road in Colorado and uh, it, it was a dangerous stretch of highway. And they had one of them, you drive an army Jeep trucks that they were gonna take down that mountain. And they were going to Black Bear Road, which had a sign on it that said, Black Bear Road, you don't have to be crazy to drive this road, but it helps, right? Yeah, have you been, is that the Caledonian Pike? Have you been on roads like that? Right, yeah. Um, I thought about that in reference to this unwanted behavior series. And I think each of these roads that we're talking about here are roads that you have to be crazy to go on them. For example, the entitlement interstate. Do you want to be that person? Everyone says, he just acts like he's so entitled. It'd be crazy to want to be that person. Or, or the escapism extension. Do you want to be that person that she's always just trying to find a way to escape responsibility? You don't want to be that. Or, or the intrigue intersection or the control corridor. Those are not good places to be. And if you're on those highways, you do want to get off of them. Today, the highway or the portion of roadway that we're talking about, I have named the roundabout of futility. Have you ever been on a roundabout? Wow, they were going to put one on Beaver Avenue in Dubois, right? And I was so excited because I love roundabouts. You can take out other drivers really easily. You know, it's just fun, right? And, you, and social media exploded, you know, like, don't do that. People will die, you know? <laughs> I can remember the first time I was on a roundabout, it was in a mall parking lot and it was really confusing. I'm like, why did they do this? And it didn't make any sense to me. But I've been on roundabouts all over the place from here to Japan. And, uh, they're pretty cool. Roundabouts, I, when, when I went to uh, see my son and son-in-law and daughter, my grandchildren in the Arabian Peninsula, one time Brian said to me, hey, you, uh, you're gonna need to drive. So, you know, get a 3A uh, international driver's license and uh, talk to your insurance company and be ready to drive when you get here. And I was just scared to death. The roundabouts scared the living daylights out of me. But here's what I learned. Once you learn to navigate a roundabout, if you learn to navigate a roundabout, and if you are on the roundabout with other people who know what they're doing, then they are incredibly smart and they are incredibly effective. But that is a really big if at the start of that. If you don't know what you're doing on a roundabout, you may go round and round and round in futility. Futility. That's a word, right? Feelings of futility. I often say to my wife, you know, my wife works out. She works out religiously. And so uh, she'll be headed to the gym or wherever she's going to work out. And she has whatever she's wearing to work out in. And, and as she's at the door, I'll look at her. And I haven't done this in years. I need to start doing it again because it's really annoying. I'll, I'll look at her and I'll say to her, exercise, eat right die anyway. <laughs> right? right now, she will immediately say to me, you don't exercise and eat right so you can live forever. You do it so that you can live well. Okay, I get that. But it's still funny. What I said is still funny, right? And it points out the reality of futility. You know what futility means. If we say something's futile, we're saying that it really has no constructive effect. We're saying that it, it achieves nothing of any real value. It's kind of like um, my kids have a plastic, my grandkids have a plastic lawnmower, right? If you come over and you see me pushing that across my lawn back and forth and back and forth, you're going to say, that's an exercise in futility. There's no value there. Futility is bailing the water with a Dixie cup out of the boat that's taking on a gallon at a time. That's never going to happen. Futility is bringing a knife to a gunfight. It's a bad idea. It's not going to work. We know what futility is because everyone experiences feelings of futility. I didn't watch the college football national championship with TCU in Georgia. Anybody watch that? No? Okay. You guys, you only watch if it's Penn State, right? Yeah, I understand. Every 30 years. So anyway, 
Oh, that was mean. Some of you are walking out, right? I get it. I get it, yeah. Hmm. I got it. You know that game ended. What was the score? Like 50, 65 to 7 or something like that? And at halftime, it was 30-something to 7. I'm thinking if, if the TCU players at the halftime, when they're in the locker room, I think some of them felt like it's just futile to go out and finish this game. Futility. <laughs> and it was. Surprisingly, a person can be ahead in the game and still feel feelings of futility. Uh, surprisingly, a person can be what we would consider a phenomenal success, and yet they realize a sense of futility regarding their life. Did you notice I used the verb realized rather than the word feel? It's not that they feel a sense of futility in their life. They do, but they realize it because it is, in many cases, it's accurate because of how they're living their life. Feelings of futility can happen to somebody who's been a champion. For example, do you know that gentleman? That gentleman is J. Robert Oppenheimer. Some of you may know he was the father of the atomic bomb. He changed the world in ways that rival Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Oppenheimer was a physicist. You know, think of Sheldon, right? He was a physicist, and during World War II, he served not as just a worker, not as just an engineer, but he served as the head of the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. He was the leader of the Manhattan Project. He oversaw our country's development of the atomic bomb. And on July 16th, 1945, a plutonium device, they called it Gadget. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Gadget was lifted, hoisted up to a 100-foot tower and was detonated at 5.30 a.m. It instantly, instantly vaporized that tower and turned the surrounding asphalt and sand into glass. And then seconds after that explosion, individuals, people who thought they were far enough away were knocked to their keisters. Are the keisters here? <laughs> they were knocked on their butts because that blast was so strong at that great distance away. Oppenheimer is observing this. And he later reflects upon it with probably, if you've ever heard anything Oppenheimer said, this is what you said, or what you heard rather. He's standing there and he's observing the mushroom cloud as it's ascending from the desert floor in New Mexico. And a thought comes to his mind from Hindu literature. It's a great poetic statement. Listen to it. Now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. Is that not an appropriate line, right? <laughs> that is Oppenheimer's most oft-quoted statement. But I feel like there is an equally important statement that Oppenheimer made later in his life. He was a chain smoker, and so he had cancer, and he knew his death was coming. And remember for a minute to who this guy is before I give you this last, this second quote. He joined the war effort voluntarily because he believed that stopping fascism was a matter of saving Western civilization. He was appointed the head of the Manhattan Project. When he showed up with his backpack, all the other physicists and engineers said, he's the guy. He's the guy. He's the father of the atomic bomb. He was the head of the Manhattan Project. This is J. Robert Oppenheimer, for crying out loud. One year before his death, he said this, I am a complete failure. And in speaking of his achievements, he remarked, they leave on the tongue only the taste of ashes. Huh. You see, maybe it doesn't matter what you've done. 
Maybe it doesn't matter who you are, how skilled you are, how smart you think you are, how important you are. Feelings of futility can haunt any one of us, every one of us. For you and me, I think maybe feelings of futility take root in mundane engagements. Meaningless pursuits are the fertile soil of the weeds of futility. Think for a minute. You know those days when you're just kind of in a melancholy funk? You know what I'm talking about? You're down in the dumps, have the blues, can't seem to shake them. Just feel a light depression. Eh, I just don't feel really good about life right now. The next time that that happens to you, take a moment and reflect on the hours previous to that feeling showing up inside your life. Or maybe even go back a day or two and, and see how, what were you doing before this sadness showed up in your life? I would bet you that there was a meaningful, I'm sorry, I would bet you that there was a meaningless pursuit somewhere along the way. This past week, I was in Albuquerque and uh, I spent Saturday and Sunday lying on a couch. I went to church Sunday morning, of course, but Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, lying on a couch watching football, NFL football. Those games are what, three hours long, something like that? There were four of them, three, six, nine, 12 hours of just sitting there eating tortilla chips and watching football. I loved it. I'm watching it with my son. He's there as well. This is great. But when it ended, and even a little bit the morning after, I felt this little, little tinge, this little whisper of depression. Why in the world would I be feeling blue? I'm with my granddaughter. I don't know if you've ever seen my grandkids, but they are outstanding. I mean, how can I feel blue when I'm with her? I'm, with, I'm on vacation. I've just watched a ton of football. Why do I feel that? Meaningless pursuits. That can happen with television. It can happen with video gaming. It can happen with gaming gaming. It can happen with hanging out with your family or being with your friends. It can happen with playing ball. It can happen with hunting, with fishing, with being in the choir, being in the band. It can happen with anything. Here's why. Here's why. All those things, as good as they are, are mundane. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I think you got the wrong word there, Pastor Steve. Well, the word mundane has two definitions according to the Oxford English Dictionary. The first is on the screen. It means lacking interest or excitement, dull. And those football games were not lacking interest, excitement, or dull. So when I say that, that futility or feelings of futility is rooted in mundane engagements, I'm not meaning engagements that are lacking in interest or excitement or dull. I'm using the second definition of the word. And the second definition of mundane is this, of this earthly world rather than a heavenly or spiritual one. You see, when our lives are centered that's an important word. On the mundane, the things of this world, whether good or bad, will inevitably, eventually fe bring feelings of futility to our hearts. And if we're not aware of that, and if we're not willing to address that, then we're going to be on a futil futility roundabout. If you know your Bible, you know that some of the greatest expressions of fertility, yeah, fertility. So, you know, I showed you my new coffee cup mug, right? And it keeps coffee really hot. And we got a new coffee maker that my coffee thermos fits in. And so two days ago, two days ago or yesterday, I, I made coffee right into that thermos. And I put the lid on and I did this. And this lip is blistered right here. And that's why I'm saying all my words wrong today. <laughs> Let me start again. If you know your Bible, you know that some of the greatest expressions of futility come from King Solomon. 
especially in the book of Ecclesiastes, a book that speaks a lot about futility. I mean, right from the very start, your Bibles are open there, right? I told you to open to Ecclesiastes 1, I believe. So your Bibles are open there. And in the second verse, I mean, the first verse, he said, here's who I am. And now the second verse, he says this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. And I think he's disgusted. I think he's disgusted because of it. The ESV, the King James, the Lexham English Bible, the New American Standard, they use a different word than meaningless. They use the word vanity, but they don't mean vanity as in you're so vain, you probably think the sermon's about you. <laughs> they mean vain like, man, we did all that and it was in vain. It was for nothing. It was meaningless. The Christian Standard Bible translates it futility. It says, absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. And then in the next couple chapters, chapter one and chapter two, Solomon demonstrates that point. And, and we're going to look at those sentences, those points he makes, but something I want you to notice and hear this. These areas in which Solomon is performing an exhaustive search for meaning are the very same areas that we drive by as we go around the roundabout of futility. The very same ones. It is almost as though there is nothing new under the sun. Solomon tried to escape futility by looking the same places that you and I look for meaning today. And Solomon discovers the same thing as we discover. First, Solomon says, you can't escape feelings of futility through education. This is so dangerous, isn't it, Laurel? How many teachers do we have here? Wow, attendance is going to be down next week, isn't it? I'm just kidding. You cannot escape feelings of futility through education. In chapter 1, Paul, or Solomon indicates that he is educating himself. In verse 13, if your Bible's open, he says, I applied my mind to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. I applied my mind. I'm educating myself. Education. Solomon, that's a great place to start. But education is going to let him down. I believe in education. I just don't believe that it delivers a satisfactory sense of meaning or purpose in life. There's no guarantee there. By verse 17, Solomon has reached a bit of a conclusion. He says, then I applied myself to understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned this too is a chasing after the wind. That's a phrase Solomon loves, chasing after the wind. No one here can run fast enough to catch a hold of the wind. It would be a futile thing to try. And no one here can fill up their brain full enough to exercise the feelings of futility from the mind. Education won't do it. Look at his words in verse 18. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And so pursuing education and knowledge, we tend to spin in these cycles, circles of the roundabout of futility. Solomon moves on exploring another method that's familiar to us. And he realizes you cannot escape feelings of futility through pleasure. And we, we try this all the time. You feeling blue? Let's go shopping. All right, that helps. You feeling down? Hey, let's make some comfort food. Let's do that. Are you feeling like things aren't working out? Been a bad week for you? Let's do a night on the town, catch a movie. What do you think about that? Let's do that. Let's find pleasure in order to bring meaning to our lives. Look at verse one of chapter two. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Pleasure does not counteract futility. And he kind of expounds on that 10 verses later in Ecclesiastes 2.10. He says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was a reward for all my toil. And yet 
When I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. He's going in circles. He's stuck on a roundabout. It's meaningless. It's futile. In the next verses, Solomon kind of drills down on this thing called wisdom, but he discovers that you cannot escape feelings of futility through wisdom. Wisdom is good, right? I mean, it beats being a fool. You want to be someone who's wise. Yeah, wisdom is good, but that doesn't mean wisdom is without futility. Take a look at verse 14 of chapter two. The wise have eyes in their head while the fool walks in darkness. But I came to realize the same fate overtakes them both. Whether you're wise or a fool, you're gonna die. You're gonna die. And I feel like maybe the next verse, verse 15, should have exclamation points in it. Because you know when, when he says, I came to realize the same fate overtakes them both, and then in verse 15, then I said to myself, the fate of the fool is gonna overtake me also. What, what then do I gain by being wise? I ask myself, I said to myself, this too is meaningless. How ironic. And I'm using the word ironic correctly here. How ironic that wisdom, the very thing for which Solomon is praised, the very thing by which he was gifted, the very thing for which he is known, wisdom is incapable of moving, removing his feelings of futility. And he's spinning around on the roundabout meaningless. Solomon decides, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep myself busy. You know, I'm going to be industrious and that's a virtue, right? So that's not all bad, but Solomon concludes that you cannot escape feelings of futility by keeping busy. It's in verse 21. He says, for the person, a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it, this too is meaningless and a great misfortune. Now the thought of leaving your estate to another may or may not provokes feelings of futility for you, but that's not really Solomon's only issue with busyness. All the hard work that you do doesn't make you sleep any better at night. Sometimes we tend to look though to our vocation to do that for us. But frankly, probably one of the things that's kept me up most at night is my vocation. It's kept me from sleeping. My mind can so obsess about what I'm doing, what I'm not doing, what I need to do, what I should have done, and the things I need to fix in order to get what I want accomplished, accomplished, that I am so obsessed by that, I lose sleep, and it plagues my mind to the point that when I finally get what I was trying to get, I can't even enjoy it. That's futility. That's meaninglessness. And and that's why Solomon says in verse 23, all their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their hands, I'm sorry, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. And so we spin on a circle, the roundabout of futility. But I want to show you something here. I want you to see something here that Solomon is disclosing to us. Solomon is onto something and he's revealing a roundabout exit strategy. It's in verse 24, look at it. A person can do nothing better. And by the way, he's not resigned here. I don't believe he's like, I guess there's nothing better to do than this. Okay, listen to what he says. A person can do nothing better than to eat, and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This too I see is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? It's a little hint to Solomon's answer. You find satisfaction. Something distinct from futility, satisfaction, when you regard things like education and things like pleasure and things like wisdom and your work, when you regard them as gifts from God to be used to find your meaning in him. I'm gonna say that again. 
you find satisfaction. Something distinct from futility when you regard things like education, pleasure, wisdom, and your work as gifts from God to be used to find meaning in him. Let's exit Ecclesiastes. You thought I was going to say the roundabout. Let's exit Ecclesiastes and let's go to Psalm 127. If you would turn there, please, I would be grateful. In your Bible, Psalms is kind of in the middle. So open your Bible to the middle, you'll be in Psalms. And as it would happen, Psalm 127 is right after 126. So it's pretty easy to find. Psalm 127. In this Psalm, Solomon clearly says to make God the center of your entire life. Make God the center of your entire life. If you want to get off the roundabout of futility, you're going to need to make God central in every single part of your life. And that last phrase, every single part of your life, I think that's accurate. We're going to read it. Psalm 127, it's only five verses long. It, by the way, is written by Solomon as well, the only one of the Psalms of Ascent that's written by him. Verse one, it's going to be familiar to some of you. Unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guard stands watch in vain. Do you hear the vanity there again? And it's in the next verse, in vain, you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward from him, like arrows in the hands of a warrior or children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponent in court. Okay, I'm reading that and I just have to ask the question. What does Solomon mean when he says, unless the Lord builds a house? What's the house, Solomon? And some people who know biblical history might say, well, I'm thinking maybe it's the temple. Because after all, David wanted to build a temple. God said, nope, you can't build a temple. Your son will build a temple. Solomon's building a temple. Eventually it's going to bear his name, Solomon's temple. So Solomon, he could be talking about a building project. Unless the Lord is building this temple. Those of us who are working on it are doing it in vain. I, I can guarantee you, the men and women who built the building you are in knew this passage of scripture and used it over and over again. Unless God does this, we can't do it. We're working in vain. And I can tell you, I can't tell you because I wasn't here for this building, but I was here for that addition. And I can tell you that Jim Bell and the rest of us must have said that dozens of times. Unless the Lord builds this building, we are laboring in vain. Is that what Solomon meant? Maybe. Some people say, I think he's talking about the kingly line, the, the messianic line eventually, the, the throne of David. After all, he is a successor to his father, King David. King David is his, his dad, and, and then he is David's son who will take the throne. The throne of David, that's pretty important because I don't know if you remember someone named Jesus. I know you do. You remember when Gabriel was speaking to Jesus's soon-to-be mom, Mary? And in that conversation, Gabriel makes this remark in Luke 1.32. He says, the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. The throne of David, that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. Maybe Solomon's words are, you know what? Unless the Lord is building this line, we're building it in vain. And in times in history when the Lord wasn't building that line because they were doing the wrong things, that line got kind of muddled a little bit, right? But the Lord was always there. So yeah, maybe. Maybe when Solomon says, unless the Lord builds a house, those that build it, build it in vain. Maybe he's talking about the Messianic line. Other people feel like, well, maybe he's talking about his household, his family. And you might kind of say, well, I don't think so. I don't know about that. But it can kind of make sense because all of a sudden without notice, and I'm sure you noticed in verse three, he says, children are a heritage to the Lord. And Solomon's not dumb. He's written a lot. And, and, and surely if that was a whole separate thing, he would have just written a whole separate Psalm. And we'd have 151 Psalms instead of 150. There's, there's gotta be a connection there. Children are a heritage from the Lord. What is it? Is he talking about the temple? 
Is he talking about the kingly line? Is he talking about families? I don't know, maybe all of the above. I can tell you this, the application is for all of the above and more. I believe Solomon is saying, if God is not the active center of every single part of your life, then meaningless will haunt your entire life. Meaningless will hold you, meaninglessness, I'm sorry. Read it again, Steve, because it's important. If God is not the active center of every single part of your life, then meaninglessness is what that should say, will hold you captive. It will haunt your entire life. If on the other hand, God is the active center of every single part of your life, then your life will be rich with meaning and satisfaction. And so with that concept in our mind, you know, we've, we've, we've gone through Ecclesiastes 1 and 2 and we've explored Psalm 127. There are just some questions that are worth considering in your life. And that, the first one's gonna sound silly. Is the Lord central to your faith? What are you, crazy? My faith is all about the Lord. Is God central to your faith? Of course God's central to your faith. Okay, but you and I know that there are people who sit in churches every Sunday that have God in their hip pocket and something else central to their Sunday morning experience. I've been that person. Generally, that something else is good. Friends and family that they cherish. Music that they absolutely love and have come to really appreciate. And a preacher that, wow, he's great. This is in other churches. <laughs> Yeah, those are great gifts from God. But if those things are more central than God himself, futility in your faith. So this morning I ask you, is the Lord central to your faith? It is a continual choice, even a continual struggle, I believe, to make God central in every single aspect of your life. But it is the only way to get off the futility roundabout. Here's another question. Is the Lord central to my mission? Solomon had missions. Is God in the middle of that? Do you have a mission? What is your mission? Are there things that you believe? There are certain things in this world God has for me to do, and I'm just the right person to do them. What is your mission? Do you have a place in the kingdom where you know God has called you to serve? Maybe it's a ministry with children. Maybe it's a ministry to shut-ins. Maybe it's a card ministry. Maybe it's a ministry to teens. Maybe it's a coffee ministry. Maybe it's a ministry of bringing food on Sunday nights on a sign-up sheet so the teens that are here can eat. Maybe it's a music ministry. Maybe it's a ministry with men. Maybe a ministry with moms. Maybe a ministry with women. Is God at the center of that ministry? Because I can tell you this, the ministry itself can become the center of everything. I tell you that because of my experience that has happened in my life. Futility. But when God is central, you're free from that roundabout of futility. How about a third question? Is the Lord central to my entire family? Is God in the middle? Or have family activities become central to my entire family or family interests or family pursuit or pleasure or education or any of those things? Is, is that what's really in the middle of it all? I will tell you, man, I confess sin to you guys all the time. I can tell you there was a time in my life when my children, when they were at home, they were the center of my existence. That's not healthy. And that can lead you on a road to futility. When God is central, <laughs> you're free from the roundabout of futility. And it is, again, I'm gonna say a sentence again, it's a continual choice, even a continual struggle to make God central in every single aspect of your life. But it is the only way off the futility roundabout. Are there times when you kind of feel like you're on a merry-go-round, <laughs> going round and round and really getting nowhere? 
Are there times that your life just feels, you feel so futile, you, you would almost despair? Or maybe it's lighter than that for you. Maybe you're like, yeah, life doesn't have a whole lot of meaning, but who cares? And you've just kind of learned to squelch that. I don't know, what is it? Are there times that you recognize I am on the roundabout of futility? The constant solution for me is to follow this counsel one way or the other. To see the things that want to be in, my cent in the center of my life, to see those things as simple, simply gifts from God. Don't allow them to be God. They're simply gifts from him. And to place God in the center of my life and make him the Lord of all those things so that he calls the shots on the priorities in my schedule, in my family, in my job, in all my responsibilities, in my pleasure, in my recreation. God is the Lord of all that. So he prioritizes it. He calls the shots. He says when it begins, he says when it ends, he manages that. Put him in the center of your life and enjoy those good things as blessings from his hands. I wanna pray that you can do that. So if you're comfortable doing so, let's stand together. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for your love for us. So thankful, Father, that you, as you created us, desired for us to have a sense of meaning and purpose. And you gave that to Adam and Eve right out of the box, telling them what to do. And then Jesus, you provide us as well. And you remind us of that when you say, I've come that they might have life and they might have it to the full. We want our lives to matter, period. We want them to matter because you wired us with that desire. We want them to matter because those of us that are following you we want to honor you with these lives. So help us see the things that want to be in the center of my life, our life, as gifts from you. And help us to move them aside and place you in the center of our life and make you Lord of all those things. And may we enjoy them as good things, as blessings from your hand. In Christ's name, amen.
ask one of the guys from the Thursday night Bible study to conclude our time in prayer. Bill, would you lead us in prayer? Lord, thank you for this uh, time we got to do uh, worship and uh, hear a great message today. Lord, let us take this word and run with it the rest of the week. Uh, Lord, uh, protect us as we leave this place and uh, continue to bless us throughout this week. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Remember, there's no activities at Kerbinsville Alliance this evening. God bless you. Mm -hmm.